Hi, and welcome to the 10-minute video summary of the message that was shared on the 6th of March, 2016 at Henrietta Christian Fellowship. My name is Don Bolt. I'm the senior pastor at the church, and for the next 10 minutes, I'd like to share with you the highlights from this morning's message. We've been doing a series on uh, Jesus' high priestly prayer. It's in John chapter 17, and uh, it's the prayer that he prays right before he goes across the Kidron Valley into the Mount of Olives, and then eventually to the Garden of Gethsemane, where he prays and eventually is betrayed by Judas. And uh, so we know that this prayer was prayed somewhere between uh, the upper room where they celebrated the Last Supper uh, and before he exits the city. He, he stops and he looks up to heaven and he prays this prayer. And it gives us the opportunity to see intimately into what Jesus was praying for us uh, at that time. Uh, if you uh, look over into the garden now, he's praying more about the crucifixion and about himself. But, but this is him praying about us. Okay, So we get this wonderful opportunity to look into his prayer and consider the possibility that God might have given us this prayer uh, that we could um, decide that we would just want to be a part of the answer to it. All right, so uh, what the, the core of this prayer really is that they all may be one. That's what Jesus is praying for to the Father. He's praying that, that the things that are ministered to these people through me, uh, that came from you, Father, uh, I desire that, that they would cause them to be one. All right, not to be separate and go in our different ways and arguing and disagreeing with each other, but that we would come together uh, as his children and that we would you know, be his. All right, so uh, let's take a look very quickly. I'm going to review very quick. All right, so stick with me here. All right, so that they all may be one. What is it that makes us one? We know God and we know Jesus Christ. God gives us eternal life. Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they know you, all right, and that they know me, all right, that that was what caused us to have eternal life, and this experience of having eternal life should cause us to be one. You have life, I have life, you know, that should make us one. All right, going on from there, uh, we have the word of God, the actual words. Jesus said, Father, the words you gave me, I've given to them, and so we have the word of God, and beyond that the, the, we have the word of God, I mean, that word still speaks. I mean, there's books that are 20 years old that are dead as a doornail, but this book is two, three thousand years old, depending on which part of it you're looking at, uh, and it's still alive. Why? Because God is in that word uh, to fulfill it. Okay, He's there uh, to make it alive to us. The Holy Spirit, uh, you know, it gives us an understanding of how this applies to us today. All right, so we're sanctified and we're sent by the word of God, uh, which is God's truth to us. All right, and uh, so this this being sent. You know, the, the, you know we, we're, we're not our own. We're bought with a price, and God has a mission for us to accomplish. We're sent by, we're set apart by him for his holy purposes. You know, we see this in this prayer, okay? He, he says that, you know, your word is truth, sanctifying by that, uh, that, that word. And as you sent me, Father, I'm sending them into the world, all right? So these are things that cause us to say, yeah, we're a part of the same thing. We're one, all right? So it goes on and says we share the same experience, this condition of being in Christ and being fruitful because we are. All right, Jesus said that, uh, Father, he says, I desire that, you know, as I'm in you and you're in me, that they be in us, All right? And wow, that's a, I remember the first time I heard that, I thought, what on earth are we talking about here? But see, there's this relationship that we are called to uh, in the Lord with Jesus, through Jesus, to the Father, you know, that causes a fruitfulness, the, the work of the Spirit in us that causes us to be fruitful uh, in ways that bring glory to God is a powerful thing, and that should make us one according to the Scriptures, all right? And so uh, this fruitfulness is the evidence that, you know, people can see that we're his disciples because of this spiritual fruitfulness in us, that, that where people's lives are affected, people are drawn to Christ and changed and and made new uh, through what's going on in us. Okay, so uh, we have his name, all right? And, uh, you know, that this idea that you know, Jesus said, you know, you gave me uh, that name, and I've shared that name with them. And see, the name uh, is uh, is a powerful thing, all right? It's a, it, it means the character of and, and, and even the authority of is conveyed through that name. And Jesus said, I gave that name to them, all right? And so sharing this name, that we have the name of God and that we have the same name of God, uh, you know, that makes us one. All right, it should at least, all right? In some ways, somehow we miss this, but, but, it's, but it should make us one. And we should have this desire that, that if we find somebody else who has the same experience of knowing God by his name, uh, that, that should draw us into fellowship with them. And uh, one of our, our congregants who spent a long time in Israel shared with us that sometimes in a hospital over in the Holy Land, uh, what happens is if somebody's near death, 
one of the ways that they try to give life to them is actually give them a new name in that hospital bed, you know, believing that in some way they are imparting life to that person, right? So we have new life because of this name, all right? And then we have the glory, the splendor, the dignity that belongs to someone who belongs to Christ. Uh, John 17, 22 uh, uh, through 23 says, the glory which you have given me, I've given it to them, all right? So we have this. But, you know, sometimes you see in, in, in the paintings from the old days, you know, you'd see a saint or somebody who was important in the scriptures, and you see this little glow behind their head or a halo over their head. And, uh, you know, and I think we've tended to think of this glory as an outward thing, and I suppose from time to time it is. But more often, uh, the Bible tells us that the treasure that God has given to us is hidden uh, inside earthen vessels. In other words, you know, we look very ordinary to the world uh, if they just look at our outward appearance. But when they see the work of God in us, all right, then you know, they see this glory, all right, that we have this splendor, this dignity uh, that comes from being uh, so closely related to God. So what was this all about? Jesus, I believe, was praying in this, in this prayer about the fulfillment of a great promise. Abraham had been told, you know, I'm going to make you a blessing to all nations. Uh, all men are going to be blessed because of you. All right, and then in Isaiah chapter 49, verse 6, God says uh, to him, look, it is too small a thing that you, would, uh, that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. Okay, God, this is in a time of judgment, and we're hearing about this time of restoration. He says, that's too small a thing to just do that. He says, I will also make you a light to the nations so that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. See, this was uh, the, the mission uh, for God's chosen people it wasn't just to have uh, this, this relationship with God, this salvation, and, and, and keep it among themselves. God had a, a point in time where this was then going to go to all the nations. You know, the, Israel was surrounded by all these nations that worshipped all these pagan gods that came to nothing. All right, but this name, this God, all right, that name has gone out to all the world. I mean, there's hardly a place on the earth that there isn't somebody or somebody nearby uh, that has heard uh, about this God and been blessed. All right, so Acts 13, 47, we hear the scripture uh, brought up again in the New Testament because now after the death and resurrection of Jesus, it says, For so the Lord has commanded us, I have placed you as a light for the Gentiles. Keeping in mind, these people that are saying all this are Jewish believers uh, in the book of Acts, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. All right, so we hear the scripture brought up again. And in Acts 26, 23, Christ was to suffer, and to, by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he would be the first to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. All right, so that they all may be one. Yeah, this is the way that this salvation uh, that was paid for at the cross is going to be revealed uh, to the nations. All right, John 12, 44 through 50. Uh, Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me does not believe in me, but in him who sent me. Uh, he who sees me sees the one who sent me. I have come as a light into the world that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness, all right? So, and he goes on a little later in, the, in this passage to say, For I did not speak of my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me the commandment what to say and what to speak. I know that his commandment is eternal life, all right? So I believe that the, the, the joy that was set before him was this one group, this people, this group of followers, disciples, followers of his that would be one, that was the joy that was set before him, all right? And in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 12 through 16, he says, uh, remember, speaking to, to people who are Gentile believers, uh, that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. All right, that, uh, that, that this is, this is that, you know, we're being brought together, becoming one new person. All right, it says this a little later in that, that passage. It says, in himself, that he might make uh, the, the two into one new man, establishing peace. All right, and so finally, this, this place where we hear about Jesus, uh, and as he goes to the cross, that he, for the joy that is set before him, he endures the cross. And with this, I'm going to close. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 2 says this, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay us out, aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so with that, let's be one. 
God bless you. We'll see you next time in the 10-minute video summary.